Welcome to Trending in Education, the Convertible Learning Edition. I'm joined today by a team that came together in some of the more difficult times of recent years in the height of the pandemic to come up with some concepts and some approaches that can allow you to be more flexible in how we design our learning products and also how learners can engage with them. I'm happy to report that one of these folks has been on the show many times. The other two, it's their first engagement, but hopefully as demonstrated by Steve's experience, it can be habit forming. I'm going to begin by welcoming Steve back to the show. I believe this is your fourth appearance, Steve. Yep. Dr. Steve Jordans out of the University of Toronto. Welcome back to Trending in Education. Thank you. Thank you. I proudly display the Trending in Education magnet on my fridge right where it belongs. So Excellent. <laughs> very cool. Excellent. I hard earned with my three previous visits. Absolutely. And I wanted to give you credit. <laughs> I believe I just did recently give you credit for the great snapback, which is one of the topics that we talked about last spring, spring of 2021. You were characterizing us as about to enter into a great snapback where mm -hmm. folks didn't have time for the pandemic frame, the mental models that had come about through COVID-19. We were just kind of re revert back to previous thinking. I was trying to pitch for the fact that one trial learning, we were going to be so freaked out by the pandemic that it was going to change our behaviors long-term. I will here publicly say, I think that we're at to something, Steve. <laughs> so congratulations <laughs> with that idea. And then interestingly, I think that interplays well with convertible learning because convertible yep. learning is for something that would be a change that hopefully the pandemic brought about. We're going to get into all this as part of the show. To begin, we always like to get folks' origin story. I thought we could start with you, Steve. You could introduce your colleagues. We hear your origin story. And then we also hear the story of convertible learning. Spin us a yarn, kick this off however you want. It's all going to work wonderfully. All good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I like to kind of say, I think where a lot of my passion for education comes from is from a weird place, which is I like teaching large classes. I like lots of students there. I like to feel that vibe. I, you know, I'm also in a band and it's the same sort of thing for me. I want to walk into a full house and I want to feel that energy. But of, often when you teach large classes, the story you hear, especially in the media and such, is that large classes provide degraded learning experiences, shallow learning, just memorization. And I think my challenge has always been, no, that doesn't need to be the case. If you think things through carefully, and especially if you harness technology, because that is a critical part of our education now, maybe we can do better. So I've always been driven to try to understand how we can take powerful learning experiences and use them at scale. Uh, and so I've also been involved in things like teaching MOOCs because that's the same sort of concept. Massive open, Massive open online, online course. course. Yes, yes. And so I've got a few on something called Coursera.org. And, and the idea there is that people give courses for free so that people all around the world can take these courses, whether they have the finances or not, whether they're geographically close or not. It makes these courses available to everybody. So I've always loved that concept. One of your courses was really popular around anxiety and dealing yeah. with anxiety around the pandemic. We'll include some links to Steve's courses and Steve's information as part of the show notes. But the other thing that happened was the pandemic forced you as a course designer, as someone who loves teaching big courses, to suddenly have to rethink the context in which people were learning. You're already on Coursera, so you're already playing mm -hmm. with your head up around the promise of online learning. Could you help us tell the story of how the three of you got together on this project? Yeah. Uh, and so, I, I mean, we were already casually acquainted at, at some level. I'm not even absolutely sure of the whole connection story. I think I think maybe both of these uh, individuals took a course from, from me online. I'm not sure. But I know I got connected with your meet long ago. I, if, I'm not sure how long ago, five or six years ago, when we started communicating online. And she was coming to Canada looking for some opportunities. And she was clearly very bright and clearly very passionate about education. So she's been working as a postdoc uh, in my lab for a while. Um, but she has a very global view on education and a very, uh, I'm going to let them talk a little bit more about their own stories, Yeah. Uh, but she's just been a pleasure to work with. And, and 
Atif, I, I, I think Atif was in one of my courses, I'm not sure, but somehow we got connected on LinkedIn and talking, and he's very passionate about educational technology. He's an expert on educational technology, teaches it in Jordan, and he became interested in the technology we create. So we started playing with that together, talking about research, and it was really in that context with the three of us that when the pandemic hit and, and we saw how educational institutions were sort of scrambling and, you know, largely uh, Atef is the first author on this paper because he was telling us about how different geographic locations were handling the situation better or worse. And as we all started talking about that, we started thinking, you know, how, how should the education system be configured to, to do two things? One, to optimize everything we currently know about educating well, but two, to be flexible enough so that when, dare I say these words out loud, the next pandemic hits or whatever it is that hits that will disrupt us totally, that we can be ready to pivot in a relatively seamless way and kind of take the hit and keep the education going rather than what we saw happen, you know, with so many children now where, where they were really put back. So, you know, I think, I think with that as context, maybe we should have your meet and, and a Tef give a little bit more details on their background uh, yeah. to round out the story. Absolutely. Let's bring the other folks in. Dr. Iramit Kaur is a postdoctoral student at the University of Toronto, as Steve was mentioning. Welcome to the show, Iramit. Can you catch us up quickly on how you got to this point in your career and your connection to convertible learning? Yes, thank you so much, Michael. So back there in India, that's where I come from. I was already working on technology-enabled tools for learning. So that was my primary area of research. And when I came across the work of Professor Judens, I approached him. I wanted to work in that area. And he was kind enough to give me an opportunity to do some research work with him. So that's how the journey started. And when we entered the pandemic times, me being a teacher myself, I realized that even I had to work very hard to learn those skills to teach online, to learn those uh, technological aspects and everything. So it has become even more important to upskill yourself, learn new skills, not only for the teachers, but for the students as well. Mm. And for doing that, moving seamlessly towards an online platform was something that, you know, made us all think, what can we do? How can we incorporate this flexibility in our system so that tomorrow, if anything like that occurs or happens, how will we really adjust to it. Yeah, makes sense. And that brings us to Dr. Atef Abumaid, who is the lead author on this article, which is talking about convertible learning systems. Love to hear your story, Atef, and then we can get into more of the substance of the conversation. And to Steve and Hiramit's point, whether it's a pandemic or a natural disaster or other conflicts that are emerging around the world, we all need to be more flexible. Uh, I've talked a lot about VUCA mindsets. It's a very disruptive time that we're living in and the design of our learning products need to be reflective of that. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are, how you got to this point in your career, and then we can dive into convertible learning? Yes, thanks, Mike. I'm very glad to be with you today. I worked with Steve uh, a little while ago. I was searching for new tools. I always searching for new tools. My, my specialization in education and technology. So this is, the, the, this is my playground. I always look for new ways and new tools and new services that we can use to deliver new or better ways of learning and teaching. So here, Scholar was the connection between me and Steve. Proudly, I was the first in the Arabic world to try this uh, new tool. So I approached uh, Steve so I can try this uh, with my students. Right. I'm uh, associate prop uh, in uh, education and technology at the Hashimite University in Jordan. Every, every semester, I try to find the new ways of learning and teaching. Yeah, and just to jump in real quick, Pure Scholar, our listeners can't see that Steve is in fact wearing a Pure Scholar t-shirt as we speak. Another hat that you wear, Steve, is on the, the educational technology front. There is software that you developed, which is peer-to-peer. -peer. Can you just give us a quick note on what Pure Scholar is, and then we can pick up with Atef's story? 
Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I think an important distinction that we're going to talk about as we talk about the convertible learning system is sort of two things we do as instructors. One is we obviously try to transmit concepts, information to students, and, and that's the traditional thing we've done very well, I think. Um, but more and more, we realize in the modern world, we also have to get much more formal and structured about teaching skills like critical thought, creative thought, communication, collaboration. You know, these are the skills we need in this highly dynamic world. These are the skills our students need. Uh, and so Peer Scholar was really created as an educational tech tool that harnesses peer assessment and formative learning to create an environment where students are really exercising these skills in the optimal way. Yeah. And so that's sort of where it sits. And yeah, it will form part of our story along with other skill building sort of notions. Yeah. And it's nice seeing that just to your previous point about scale, it scales, but it's still about real time human connection and feedback. So it is a way in which I think reframing the conversation, in some ways it reminds me a little more of some of the decentralization themes that we're hearing about through Web3 and yep. the blockchain and all that. It is more bottom-up, peer-to-peer, which is interesting architecturally. Yes. We'll get back into some of that stuff a little bit later on, but at, at TEP, so that's how you connected. You're continually foraging for new and emerging technology solutions. You're based out of Jordan. This is also why this is a really global conversation among the three of you, Steve out of Canada, Irmid originally from India, now based out of Canada with Steve. And then Atef, you're in Jordan representing the Arabic world and representing different geographies. Can you continue to give us a little more context around who you are and how you plugged into this project? Yeah, yes, of course. My specialization in education and technology Puts me in the, the, this front with my students, my uh, teaching, my students learning, and always trying to find better ways in delivering teaching and trying to help my students to learn better. Yeah. I think we have to get this right, to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with our students, to get beyond surface learning. Our students, they don't need any more, especially in this very competitive world, they don't need surface learning they have to be better in their knowledge and the skills they have we, we and we are obliged to help them to achieve just that trying to search in this path i uh, approached steve's peer scholar was a, a, a brilliant uh, tool for me to try trying to try new things for myself and my students find the new paths to learning this tool was very effective and in the middle of that, coronavirus just came up. Yeah. So we uh, had this almost weekly discussion well, with uh, Steve, uh, then uh, Hermit uh, came up uh, on, on the board. So we had this idea and we had all this passion and concern about learning and this crisis and how we can understand the situation better. Yep. Uh, in, from my point of view, it was from the ecosystem. Uh, education, uh, education uh, system, uh, education landscape, how we can understand the components, the players in this field to help students, to help teachers, to help education systems to be more flexible, more convertible, and to be more effective. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the term convertible. It is the summer months here in North America. It's time to get out on the road, perhaps, put the top down, wind in your hair, it connotes some interesting ideas. Flexibility is another word that I've heard a lot. You know, I've talked many times about The End of Average, which is a great book by Todd Rose out of Harvard School of Education about how one size fits none really when it comes to learning and that each of us comes at learning from our own context. Those contexts are really varied. We've also talked a lot about universal design for learning and how accounting for difference across all dimensions really is critical to successful product design. And then learning increasingly is being thought of as learning products, learning ecosystems. Steve, maybe coming back to you to kick off the next round, high level, can you frame up for us what convertible learning is, what a convertible learning system is, why you wrote the paper? And we can bring in Atef and Iramitz where it makes sense. 
Sure, sure. Yep. Before we get into the details, because the details are where the really interesting stuff is, I think, because it's it's a question of how you craft these learning experiences and blend from one to another. But at the high level, one of the things I'm kind of proud of of the paper is our, our first few paragraphs are much more whimsical than you would maybe find in a scientific paper often. And I wasn't sure they would get through the process, but they did. And we do use that convertible kind of analogy, which I think is very good. And, and the idea of the convertible is, you know, when things are great, you can put the top down and you have a certain kind of experience. And it's, you know, an experience is great on many levels, sun on your face, wind in your hair, that kind of thing. But on other levels, you know, the wind is blowing by and it's very noisy and et cetera. What kind of SPF do you have in a yeah, sunny day? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so it's got its pros and it's got its cons, you know, and then on a rainy day, the bad stuff happens. You can very quickly put the top up and continue driving, but the experience has changed. You know, it's, it's now, for example, the radio probably sounds a little crisper, but you don't have the wind in your hair. So it's a, it's a different environment. And the notion is you can go in a convertible between these two states very quickly and sort of continue the drive. You don't really need to disrupt that much. And that was the overall goal where we said we wanted to kind of take a step back and say, you know, we know about flipped classrooms. We know about, you know, pure learning. We know about so many sort of techniques that can be used. We also know about what worked in the traditional model. How can we imagine a convertible kind of approach where, you know, what would we be doing when everything's great? What would we be doing when a pandemic hit? And how can we kind of move from one to the other and keep the education of the students going forward? So that was the overall analogy that we were trying to hold. And then from there, again, it becomes the details of how we craft those different components. Awesome. And let's get into the details in a bit. But before we do, it does also remind me of, you know, it's baseball season when you have a retractable dome. Those stadiums are also convertible and it is important to design with that in mind. The reasons why people might be displaced are really varied nowadays, really on both ends too, right? So this accounts for the instructor being less available. And to me, it feels very much in line with a more high level concept around hybrid learning, mm -hmm. because in some ways the convertibility, one of the dimensions that you convert along is how in-person versus online might interact with the learning experience. Maybe picking up with you. Iramid, any thoughts on convertible learning? What about that resonates with you? Any context you think that might be relevant? I do like the broad representation of context across the globe presented by the panel, which is great. But any thoughts jump to mind for you, Iramid? Yes, definitely. One of the most important aspects in the paper is that it really doesn't matter whether the windows are open or they are not, the roof is open or not. Eventually, you'll reach your destination. So the learning experience is definitely there, but how do we really maximize that experience? How do we uh, enrich it more? And how do we take the best of both the worlds, online and the traditional learning? This is what we have tried to include in the paper. Mm -hmm. So while sticking to the essence of traditional learning, the theoretical lectures, how do we move ahead by incorporating the latest technology and the skilling, the skills part that we were discussing? Yeah, it reminds me of the idea of anti-fragility. You know, the idea that we're in a world where things are increasingly fragile, increasingly brittle, things can break. Yes. You know, a, a turn of phrase that I don't like a lot that's being kicked around now is learning loss. You know, there was a missed opportunity generally around cancellations or around drift where people couldn't connect into online. Maybe it wasn't delivered well enough. There really was increased resistance built in, increased risk of failure was built into the continuity plans for instruction. At TEF, I, I imagine you could attest to this in your own experience. How did you see some of the challenges present themselves? And then where does convertible learning start to bridge us perhaps into a more resilient and better way of thinking about course design? I think the world is getting to the two crises, two problems, two disruptions. It, it is part of the reality. We have to accept it. Part of our job is to try to be more flexible, more convertible, more determined, more persistent to reach our equality education. Mm -hmm. So we don't want just to accept the reality, but we have to be more effective in response to what reality shows up. Mm -hmm. So we have the tools, we have the services, we have the knowledge, we have many things to build on, which 
can enable us to reach our destination, to reach our goals in a very good way, in an in, in effective way. Whether it's in, in part of our position as teachers or students or education systems, we have the things we can utilize. We have the uh, goal, equality education. We have the tools. We have everything. It's only we need to be more determined and we, we need to be uh, more, more open to realities with our experiences. It is not acceptable by education systems or individuals just to go beyond the crisis uh, by going back to how they used to be before the crisis. So we have experience. We need to benefit from the experience. So education systems, individuals, teachers, it's not acceptable just to fold our papers and go back to how we used to be before the crisis. It's a new reality and we need to accept it and build on the experience we have right now. Exactly. If I may, Michael, the great snapback is something you know I predicted, and that's sort of what Tef is talking about. It's almost like if we're not careful or if we're not determined, it would be the better word, we will snap back and, and we will go back to doing things the way we used to do. That is human nature. That's why it was such an easy prediction for me. We are creatures of habit and, right. and you know we've had our habits in certain ways. And so to some extent, what we're trying to sneak in there is say, hey, hey, before we snap back, you know, right. let's consider if we really want to snap back right. and you know, let's look forward in other directions. It's a hard time to make this argument because we're all exhausted from the pandemic. Right. But I think we've also all experienced the pros and cons of traditional approaches and online approaches. And so it's also, you know, simultaneously the worst and the best time to consider how we can move forward and, and, and create something that's, that's a little different. Yeah. And we want to get into some of those specifics. It was funny when Atef was, was talking, suddenly my imagination of the convertible turned into more of a Humvee that was <laughs> regardless of what resistance is put in front of it. You can still put the top down on a sunny day if it can get over some rough terrain and maybe withstand some random fire because it does feel like that's the world, sadly, that we're all living in to some extent. The concept of VUCA that I touched on, the concept of perpetual disruption is becoming more prevalent nowadays. And it's, Steve, I want your quick take on this. Sadly, I think this might be the end of the snow day. And as a, a, a Canadian, I want to get your take <laughs> on how convertible learning relates to snow days, perhaps as a use case, we did want to get into some specifics. I would be curious about if I'm designing courses, I think increasingly just about everyone is, which is another yeah. massive transformation that has happened. The number of people who are thinking about using online tools to design courses and, you know, folks who may have been cautious clickers, a little reluctant to get in there, have been forced into this migration. Some have really taken to it, but as folks are trying to think about how to design in new and better ways. What are some of the specific concepts that you're outlining around convertible learning that folks might be able to use in their day to day? Yeah. So first of all, I think a Tef has no idea what you're talking about with snow days. Although actually I have a, had a colleague that was in Jordan recently and it, and it snowed while he was there. So, so maybe, maybe occasionally he sees it, but I don't think it's ever enough to cancel school. <laughs> I'd be surprised. But let me kind of lead with, I think what our most extreme sort of position is, and that's a sort of reimagination of how we use class time, because to some extent, what our argument is, is let's realize what we can do really well online and what we can do really well well is lay foundations for a deeper learning that we can carry on in person. And that's both for information and skills. So if we think of information, you know, yes, we think of the lecture as sort of the stereotypical way of presenting things. But if you consider a very well-constructed, well-designed video on that same topic where you have the compelling narrator, but you also have the ability to have, you know, immediate animations and interactivity of various styles, you, you can actually present that content in a much more compelling way through a short video. Uh, and that's great for students to get the, the basic foundations of the concepts. But then to really understand them at a deeper level, they need to work with that information. 
And so if we imagine that they, they get their foundational learning online, but then come to a classroom and now we're, you know, the classroom for us is always going to be about soft skills. It's always going to be about working with information and working with others to go through things. And that's what we really imagine is when we have them in our classrooms, let's make the most of that. That's the time we can be human. So let's be human. And, and also for skill development. You know, things like Peer Scholar are great for laying the foundations of critical thought, creative thought, communication. Mm -hmm. But it's still an online platform. It's asynchronous, so you have time to think before you respond to a peer, et cetera. Where we really want to get students is where they can do all that in a face-to-face, -face, you know, synchronous environment, a mm -hmm. real-time environment. Mm -hmm. So they can learn the basics of this stuff online, and they can do that anytime. But then when we have them in classrooms, you know, let's not have my 1800 students, regardless of what I just said about loving big classes, let's imagine classrooms that are configured in a way that really allows students to take what they've been learning online and put it into practice together. And in so doing, practicing all these skills, these soft skills, we might want to call them, you know, in a direct way and making that a core part of our educational system so that when they graduate, they've been there, they've worked in teams, they've maybe worked on experiential learning projects where they've worked with community partners on real problems. Let's bring some of that real world into our classroom at the times when learning is good. So that's sort of in broad strokes, the sense of it is, is maximizing the digital for what it delivers, but also realizing where it stops. Yep. And then realizing that's the point where we need to take over with the humanity. Yeah, that's great. I wanted to pick up with Irabi next, talking a little more about the skills and the soft skills. Uh, I like to say I get social emotional baby periodically <laughs> on the show because social emotional skills are a big deal. Although interestingly, there's even yeah. been a backlash against SEO, particularly in the US, which is something we, we've been watching carefully. Hopefully that subsides. But when you think about the future of work and you think about employability, some of the things that Steve was just talking about, how do you think about that type of skill development? I got a sense that Steve's kind of touching on there's certain social human skills that are best developed peer-to-peer -peer, collaboratively, perhaps mm -hmm. in person, probably synchronously. But I'd love to get a little more of your thinking on this, both what types of skills and then how you design for their development. Okay, so our uh, CLS system actually is divided into three components. The first one being the content learning, which Professor Jordan just talked about, that making small lectures, video lectures for the students. Not the three hour one, but very short video lecture so that there's a lot of retention, more retention. So once the students can watch it, maybe asynchronously before coming to the actual class. So this is an online forum. So once they're familiar with the concepts, the foundations, the time is now to come into the classes and where maybe the teachers can help them to enhance their skills, the soft skills, how they apply those theoretical concepts to a practical world. So something offering them more practical opportunities to practice their knowledge, to practice their skills, maybe even providing them with more work integrated learning opportunities, mm -hmm. collaborations, enhancing their social skills by again, teamwork, lots of activities, lots of discussions, and also by incorporating that human element, which we often find missing in the online world. That is the second component, skill enhancement that will happen in class. So the third one is the assessments. And as we were discussing about peer assessments, I think that is another level where we can talk about student engagement. So engagement at all the three levels, the content mm -hmm. learning, the skill enhancement, and the assessment part. Mm -hmm. That will take care of the different kind of skills that the student needs to have a more practical insight. Because right. this is one lesson COVID learning has taught us that we have to be open to everything. Yeah. And then at depth, there are other skills that the instructors are going to need to bring to bear. One of the things that we've noticed throughout the pandemic is that in many ways, teachers have taken a lot of the brunt of the change and the change management. And that's why having tools like this system that can help get the teachers equipped to design in new ways, but they don't have a lot of time. It's a challenging world as an instructor. You've helped instructors, you've taught as well. What about the skills that are necessary there and how are folks making that adjustment? How can we help them make the adjustment to some of these new ways of teaching? I think knowing the strengths and the weaknesses of the tools we have, the situations we are living now, 
uh, it, it can enable us to uh, deal better with this, uh, the, this situation. We have students, we have very competitive work, we have high demands from the market and uh, the, the work, and the careers they, they will have in the future. We have to move beyond the content, we have to move beyond surface learning. We have to focus on the life skills. We need problem solving, we have critical thinking skills. Part of the strength of this model, we don't miss these fundamentals. We have the core of education systems as teachers. We have to be deeply concerned with life skills, the soft skills, critical thinking, problem solving. Our students need beyond the content. We have to help students to make sense of the content. The simple part of education is to deliver information, which is not or shouldn't be the focus of our jobs as teachers or lecturers or stuff. Helping students to move beyond that and to help them make sense of the knowledge and to apply it and to make connections between this knowledge with their uh, life, our job is to prepare our students to life. Helping them to be better citizens, better people, better people doesn't stop by giving them knowledge or information. We have to move beyond that and help them make sense of that, apply that, and to connect with each other, trying to implement what we give them in the form of skills, soft skills or life skills or whatever. That main point here is to move beyond the knowledge to be more focused on skills to give them the situation where they can apply skills to connect it with their real life yeah i love that i've been thinking more lately about how increasingly it's becoming less about the what and more about the how and the why you know how do i do it and why do i do it and that's where if there isn't an alignment with the relevance, what's in it for me, you know, why, and then how do I do it? You know, in some ways, if you can abstract that and the, what becomes more, what's kind of flowing through the system, it's almost like the importance of learning how to learn. Steve, we're getting yep. closer to the big finale here. Can you help us adopt maybe a little more of a future facing lens here? What do we see on the horizon? How do we think about convertible learning and many of the real challenges that our instructors and instructional designers, people who care about the future of learning. What do you see on the horizon and how might convertible learning help folks make sense of things? Well, maybe one of your viewers can help with this, by the way. This is something that's been bothering me for decades. There is a word in some cultural language. Somebody told me this, where this cultural language does not make a distinction between student and teacher. They assume that that's the same role. You're just at different points along the continuum. I think we more and more as teachers have to show our students we're students as well, mm -hmm. that, that we're learning, we're developing, we're changing what we do. And I think we really need to model, you know, we, we so often had this traditional approach where it was all about, we're going to tell you stuff and you have to get it right. We live in a world where there is not necessarily a consistent right. You have to learn to be flexible. You have to learn to pivot. You have to learn to embrace failure. And these are the kinds of things that universities traditionally don't teach. I think we need to model it. I think more and more we're going to see uh, instructors trying these different things, hopefully in very mindful ways. That's what we're trying to help is, you know, here's a real mindful way to, to do these things. But I think modeling this with our students is really, especially when we fail, like being in a classroom saying, I'm going to try this thing. It's supposed to work. Here's why. Let's try it out. Oh my goodness, it didn't work. How could we do it better? Doing things like that with our students is what they need to see because that's what their world is going to be. It's going to be a much more entrepreneurial, gig-based kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we need to give them the skills. And the other important thing I'll mention is, you know, Atef's been talking a lot about going beyond information and knowledge and getting to skills, which I agree with 100%. When you're doing the why, you better understand the what as well. You know, when you're working with the knowledge, you're learning the knowledge. So it's not an either or, it's not a trade-off. Um, right. There's just a real powerful advantage we can give by shifting our focus more towards skills. And, and that's where I think the future 
will go much more hands-on, much more active, much more experiential learning, plugged into the real world, authentic sort of uh, assignments. That's when our students need to feel that the education is relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as we do that, we'll feel that resonance with them. And, and yeah, that's where I imagine us going is a much more authentic form of education for our students. That's really interesting. It does also make me think about the skills and competencies required for educators to your point, and then how much they might become specialized where if you're good at creating those videos, that becomes something that there is a competency around that. Which is a great example, if I may jump on, there's a science behind those videos. You know, yeah. your meet was talking about how long they should be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of information we know about how to present content in ways that will lead to a durable, strong memory. Mm -hmm. Most instructors, most lecturers don't know that science. They're doing what they do just by tradition, what they've seen. It's probably more good than bad. You know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's bad, but I am suggesting we can use the knowledge we have and really harness the research on education. And I, I think it's time for us to do that for our students, to really up our game and say, we're going to present this in the way that's going to give you guys the greatest success when you leave. The example I keep coming back to is Duolingo and how language learning has just in many ways moved massively in that direction, almost by, like without us really noticing and what else in terms of the what's that we might need to learn could be offloaded to that type of sticky, easy yep. experience, micro learning to your point, Aramid. It's really interesting to start contemplating this stuff. And what's exciting about what you're talking about here is that there is a community of practice out there who are building courses every day. Some of them are well-versed in some of these things. Some of them are in. So I think even just building a community of practice, a community of interest, who's talking more about new ways in which courses can and should be designed it is, is really exciting. We're at a point of concluding thoughts to begin to collect them and ideally share them back with us. That would be awesome. Okay. So I can jump in when we're designing a system, which is focusing on skills. <laughs> We are actually enhancing the creative skills, the critical thinking skills, the problem solving skills, empathy factor. We are enhancing all that for the students. And these are the skills, these are the traits that are required for a future entrepreneur or even an employee of, or even an employer of tomorrow. So that is where the employability skills and factors are coming in. So that is what we are trying to do to enhance these skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and our and, listeners hopefully are thinking about that in their own context, both as designers, but then also as learners themselves. The idea that we're going to have to continue to be upskilling and learning new things really throughout our lives, which is another angle. You know, you all have been focused primarily on higher ed, but if you think about these concepts, they really are applicable across early childhood development, right through K-12, and then Perhaps most importantly, lifelong learning. We don't stop learning once we get our diploma. In many ways, you're talking about building some connectivity between what you learn, perhaps in formal higher ed, and then how you might be able to then demonstrate, signal that you have these skills and then be able to ap apply them in your professional life. I type the uh, closing thoughts. Yeah, I think in the face of this dilemma or crisis, we, we have to more focused on our role in life, our role as educators, how to understand the tools available to us. Adopting the new ways and new tools can enable us to become more effective in what we do every day as educators, as students. Uh, understanding that can be a very good way to deal with this crisis, to deal with disruptions. It's very important being more flexible, more convertible. It's not the car. It's our thoughts, our, our thinking, our way of life to be more convertible, to adapt very quickly, very seamlessly, as we said in the paper, to what happens beyond what we control. Yeah, perfect. And it provides me, Steve, you know, I grew up on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. He would always talk about in the event of a crisis, look for the helpers. The helpers in many ways were the teachers. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that a lot of folks, despite all the challenges, a lot of folks really develop new skills. A lot of tools like Peer Scholar have been getting more widely adopted. I think some light bulbs are coming on. Folks have been forced 
to come to reckon with some ideas that maybe we didn't have to prior to the pandemic. You have some closing thoughts for us as we wrap up here? Yeah, and I want to introduce one new thought. We are seeing a lot of people and ourselves, including a leader in the charge, really saying, hey, let's get serious about skills. If institutions are going to get serious about skills, and I agree with you, Michael, it's got to start young. Imagine we started training our basketball players how to play basketball when they were 18. How good would our basketball players be if that's when we started? But we don't. We start at 8 nine years yeah. old. Right. And then by 19, they're flat. That's when we should be teaching critical thought, creative thought, communication skills. Mm -hmm. So the important point I want to add though, is for institutions to really take this seriously, we have to be able to measure those skills. And we now have ways of doing that as well. Mm -hmm. If we can measure the skills, then we can credential them. That's what institutions do. We can recognize, you know, people who have it. So right now we're largely recognizing memorization, mm -hmm. you know, the ability to get that content. And so I, I do think, you know, there's, there's the carrot and the stick. There's those of us out there saying, come on, let's do the skills. They're really important for student success. But I think that that critical point will be measuring them and being able to reflect them on co-curricular records or transcripts and, and allowing a student to approach a potential employer and say, you know what, my overall memory ability is not all that good, but I'm a great creative thinker and I'm a great presenter and you're an ad agency. Yeah. Aren't these the things that you value? Because that's what I bring to you. And so students can represent themselves and their skill sets and find good fits and find success. So that's my sort of dream, but it takes, you know, step by step. And we're trying to push towards that a little bit with this paper. And, and I think I'm very proud of the paper. I think it's a really interesting example of how things people have heard about from the educational space can be put together in a meaningful whole. And that was really our goal, you know, not new stuff per se, but just how can we knit all of this together in a way that allows us to, to enhance flexibility and quality at the same time. Yeah, it's a great read even for a lay person like myself and for folks who are more hands-on within formal academia, there's a lot of real tangible stuff to work on. And it is also a tool, I think, to connect into that community of practice that I was talking about. Practice. You talk to me about practice. That's an Alan Iverson joke for those of you who are listening. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining Steve, uh, Tef, and Irami. Wonderful conversation, convertible learning. If folks are curious about it, we'll include links to it on the show page. Thanks to each of you for joining us on today's show. Thanks, Mike. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Awesome. And with that, we'll wrap this show up. If you liked what you're hearing, please subscribe, tell your friends. Do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.